Hey everyone, Seth here from Theology with Seth. I'm so glad you could join us today. We are going to be continuing our series on the end times. And today we're going to be asking the question, what will Jesus do after he returns? Now Christians debate the exact details of this, but in this particular video, I'm going to be covering the main events that Christians from virtually every major denomination agree on. And so if you're ready, let's dive right in. One of the first things Jesus will do when he returns is that he will raise the dead. And we get this in part from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes, But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So this passage is teaching that when Christ comes back, he will raise all believers, all those who belong to him, from the dead. And I don't know if you noticed, but twice in that passage, it refers to Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits. And the point there is that the first fruits in a harvest or in a crop always match the last fruits, so to speak. So, for instance, if you had a, a tree that bore apples, later on it would bear more apples. And that implies that Christ's resurrection is the pattern for our future resurrection. The same thing that happened to him will happen to us one day. We see the same thing in Philippians 3. Paul writes, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And so all this begs the question, when Jesus walked out of his tomb that Easter Sunday, what was his body like? Well, let's take a look. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he had a physical body made perfect and immortal. One of the places we see this is that at the end of Luke's gospel, after the resurrection, Jesus visits his disciples, and here's what we read. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. And here it is. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. And so Jesus wasn't a ghost. He was a real tangible person capable of being touched and even sharing a meal with his disciples. He very clearly had a physical body that was glorified and immortal. Romans 6, 9 says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. And this is the pattern or template, if you would, for our future resurrection bodies as well. 1 Corinthians 15 really is one of the best chapters in the whole Bible about this topic. And here's what Paul writes there. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Take note of those key words there, imperishable, glory, power. This is how the Bible describes our future bodies. In the same chapter, Paul goes on to say, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? We will be raised with glorious immortality, never to die again, just like Jesus was. And this, I think, is a big difference between what people think Christianity teaches and what Christianity actually teaches. A lot of people think that after we die and our souls go to heaven, that that's it. We just continue to exist as ghosts floating around in the clouds or something. But according to the Bible, that's not it. One day, our souls will be reunited to our physical bodies and they will be made perfect. And also, I don't know if you caught it, but Paul says, we shall not all sleep. Sleep, as we saw in one of my last videos, is a biblical euphemism for death. And basically what Paul is saying here is that technically not every Christian will die. Because for those who happen to be living on earth when Christ returns, their bodies will be perfected instantly uh, in the twinkling of an eye, Paul says. And so depending on when Christ comes back, there could theoretically be tons of people alive today that will never have to experience death. 
I think that's really interesting. And think about some of the implications of this. So for one, we're going to have perfect health. We're not going to experience any more sickness or infirmity. No more cancer or car accidents. We're not going to need knee braces or hearing aids or any kind of medicine anymore. So we'll have perfect health. And second, we'll have perfect happiness. There's not going to be any more mental illness. So if you're someone who struggles with depression or anxiety, one day those will be things of the past and you won't have to wrestle with them ever again. And third, we'll have perfect holiness. There won't be any more temptations. For the first time in our existence, our minds, our hearts, and our bodies will be perfectly aligned with the will of God, and we'll get more enjoyment out of fellowshipping with him than even the most godly person on earth today does. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to experience this. But this does raise the question, what about unbelievers? Well, the Bible does teach that even unbelievers will be raised. Paul says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So even unbelievers will be raised, but their fate looks a lot different than ours. Daniel 12, 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so yes, unbelievers will be raised, but they won't be raised in glory. They'll be raised to face condemnation. And that brings us to the second major thing, and that's Jesus will judge the world. In Revelation chapter 20, John gets this vision right here. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So there's a lot going on in this passage, but I want to draw your attention to this stack of books there. Those books contain a a record of everything that everyone has done. And here's the question I want to ask you. According to this passage, out of all the people that are judged based on what they had done, how many of those people get eternal life? The answer is zero. Not a single one of them made it. To get eternal life, your name has to be written in a different book, which we'll look at more in just a second. But the point that we're to take away from this is that those who rely on their good deeds to get eternal life will perish. Most people in the world just kind of intuitively think that as long as they're a good person, they'll get eternal life one day. But that's just not what this passage teaches. The Bible teaches that the most good people, the best people you know, are still sinners who fall short of God's perfectly holy standard. In fact, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so if you're counting on your personal obedience or your personal righteousness to get eternal life, you're not going to make the cut. And we'll revisit this passage in just a minute, but for now, I wanted to share with you an old hymn from the 1800s that I think captures this moment really poignantly. It goes like this. I dreamed that the great judgment morning had dawned and the trumpet had blown. I dreamed that the nations had gathered to judgment before the white throne. From the throne came a bright shining angel and he stood on the land and the sea. And he swore with his hand raised to heaven that time was no longer to be. And oh, what a weeping and wailing as the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. The rich man was there, but his money had melted and vanished away. A pauper, he stood in the judgment, but his debts were too heavy to pay. The great man was there, but his greatness, when death came, was left far behind. The angel that opened the records, not a trace of his greatness could find. And oh, what a weeping and wailing, as the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed but their prayer was too late. This will be the destiny for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be for you because there's a way to be saved from the judgment of God. Let's revisit this passage again. According to this passage, it's only those whose names are written in the book of life that are saved. Other parts of Revelation refer to that as the book of life of the lamb who was slain. That is, it's referring to people who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. 
And so the point here is that only those who trust in Christ will get eternal life. In fact, the Apostle John, who was the same person who saw this vision, also recorded in his gospel, Jesus saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him or trusts in him should not perish but have eternal life. So if you're watching this today and you're not yet a follower of Christ, I hope that you'll see him, maybe for the first time, hanging on a bloody cross in your place to pay your penalty so that your debt of sin could be forgiven and permanently wiped away. And if you call out to him in your heart and place your trust in him, the Bible teaches that you will have eternal life. So I hope that you'll do that today, even before you finish this video. Otherwise, you may just find that one day your prayer is too late. And so after Jesus judges the world, next he will renew creation. So we get this in part from Romans 8, 19 through 21. Paul writes, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So think about the big story of the Bible for a second. When God first created the world, it was a wonderful paradise. But then when the first humans sinned against God and rebelled against him, kind of messed up everything. It fractured creation and brought about all kinds of suffering and pain. Or to use Paul's language, it subjected creation to corruption. But the Bible teaches that one day that will be reversed and creation will be restored to that paradise that we once knew. And the Bible refers to it as the new earth. Isaiah 65 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Peter writes, But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And Revelation 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And this, in many ways, is the climax of the Bible. It's the final stage of what we would call redemptive history. And because of that, theologians often refer to this as the eternal state, because this is the condition that we'll live in for all eternity. And I think this is another big difference between what many people think Christians believe and what we actually believe. We're not going to spend eternity floating around in some ethereal sci-fi realm in the clouds. Like, no, we're going to have physical bodies and we're going to have literal ground under our feet. We'll walk, we'll run, we'll jump. And the fact that scripture refers to this as the new earth suggests that there's going to be a lot of continuities between what we experience today and what we'll experience then. I'll just give you a sampling of these. So in the new earth, we see food and drink being mentioned. We see all believers throughout history alive and well. Think about all the people we'll recognize and, and all the great stories we'll get to hear. There's arts and entertainment. We see things like music and artistic expression. These things are big aspects of what make us human, and it looks like they'll be there on the new earth as well. We have education and learning. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about how one day we'll understand things in a much more full way than we do now. I mean, think about what it would be like to be able to ask questions directly to God and then receive an answer directly from him that you know comes from him and that you know is infallible in all of its details. We also see animals and nature, but they're not hostile or violent. We, we see that the animal kingdom is at peace in this new earth. Sports and hobbies. Now, I put a question mark at the end of that because I don't have a specific verse to point to for that. But if you think about it, since we're going to have physical bodies, I can't imagine we're not going to have physical activity like sports on the new earth. In fact, Randy Alcorn, who writes a great book about the new creation, he says that your favorite sport might be one that you've never even played before. 
I think that's exciting to think about. And also exploration, again, disclaimer, don't have a specific verse for that. But if you think about it, humans are naturally curious. We like to explore the horizons and there's nothing inherently sinful about that. And the universe is a massive place. I can't imagine God created all of that just to be thrown away. I would bet good money that one day we'll have the means to explore all of that and the time to do it. I think that sounds spectacularly awesome. But all of this leads to the main point. This is the main thing we should be looking forward to. And that's that we will finally have unhindered fellowship with God. Not only will we have all of these gifts, we will have the giver himself. And I want you to think with me back to the story of Moses. When God passed by him, Moses had to hide his face because he couldn't bear to see the glory of God in all of its vibrance and intensity. And God said, man shall not see my face and live. But according to the Bible, one day we will see his face. Revelation 22, 4 says, they will see his face. And I just can't even fathom how awesome that day is going to be. I'm so looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. C.S. Lewis portrays this moment in his Chronicles of Narnia series, and it's one of my favorite passages in all of his literature, and I wanted to share it with you. He writes this, And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after, but for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. And so that is all I have for you today. I hope this has been enjoyable and helpful. And if so, would you please hit that subscribe button and like the video if you haven't already, because it really helps me out. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments if you'd share them with me. And I can't wait to see you in the next video. Bye.